All right. Well, I see people are joining. Let's go ahead and begin today's uh, presentation on uh, episode on transforming my teaching fatherhood and life. And before I get into that, I want to make a couple of announcements that are coming up. I think they're really important. Uh, next week, next Sunday, I'll be interviewing Elaine Oliveira. And we are going to be talking about how to thrive as an online language teacher, how to set up your own teaching practice, how to uh, uh, design lessons, how to target your audience, how to select uh, recording equipment, microphones, how to, uh, well, just do everything related to online private teaching. And I'm really excited to have her on for next week's broadcast. That should be really exciting. That's next Sunday. Uh, and that, that should be really a, a wonderful opportunity to meet. And I think this opportunity will uh, give students a chance to identify the types of teachers, materials, and so forth that they might consider as they're looking for private lessons. Uh, I also want to talk about a couple of upcoming episodes that I have in July. Uh, one of the other episodes I'm working on in collaboration with uh, some other teachers is well, what are the qualities of the ideal teacher from the student's perspective as well as the teacher's perspective? And again, I'm always looking for more voices that can come on and share their experiences and so forth. Here, uh, Kaler. Kaler says, good morning. Really appreciate your help this week. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Uh, another message from uh, Tudor Joe. Happy Father's Day from Costa Rica. Uh, and Elizabeth asks about next week's presentation. Yes, that'll be at the same time. Again, that should be a really informative presentation on, again, private online teaching, especially when we find ourselves these days in uh, different si situations, difficult situations, and the transformation of classroom teaching to online teaching has had a great uh, impact. And uh, Magali says, good morning from Mexico. Happy Father's Day. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all of those comments. Well, uh, one of the other things I want to mention, uh, two things before I get into the broadcast, is last week, as I was talking about listening, I mentioned, well, actually, there was a uh, uh, information in that PowerPoint about Uglish, but I never talked about that. And certainly, I'm not going to not because of time today, I'm not going to get, go into detail about this, but Uglish is a fantastic uh, service. It's amazing. It's an amazing tool to improve your pronunciation. Uh, you type in a phrase uh, like hit the books or whatever you might uh, want to, and it's not just in English. And this service will scour the internet for videos that contain that word and the video will actually start at that point where you hear that word in the video and you can watch video after video after video that uh, can help you in pronunciation practice. I think that's a great tool for you to use. Uh, the other thing I want to do is I want to do a shout out uh, this past week. I'd like to give a shout out to the students at uh, Jose Figuras Ferrer Technical High School in the historic town of La Lucha in Costa Rica. I had the opportunity to visit with them in their class. And I certainly can say that their country and the world are in good hands with such insightful students. And it's wonderful to be a part of you know, learning and sharing around the world. Well, let's uh, get into today's presentation. I'm going to uh, begin by just a basic introduction, and then we'll just launch into the topic for uh, today. So here we go. Hi, I'm Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, presenting ideas on language teaching, culture, and human development. And today, to begin with, I want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day, whether you're a father, a grandfather, an uncle, a mother raising children, or anyone who has worked in that particular role of fostering understanding and just rearing of children, it's a, a very important uh, role in people's lives. 
And today what I'd like to talk about is a little bit about the role of being a father, uh, both in the classroom in a way and also in my teaching and just the evolution and transformation as a father over the years. So as part of that, what I want to start with some opening thoughts. And my opening thoughts come, well, there are a couple of profound statements attributed to the Greek philosopher Socrates. And Socrates said this, he said, number one, the only true wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. And the other point that I think is really important is the unexamined life isn't worth living. Now, what what do these mean? And I think these comments really resonate with me. I've been teaching over 30 years. I've been a father of you know over 30 years, but I think some of the greatest lessons of my life have been things that have happened over the last several. And I think that as I've become more self-reflective, as I have experienced different things, both in the classroom and with my family, I think those have been very transformative in the way that I engage with people. Now, please understand, being a father is full of missteps. Anyone who has been a father or who has a father realizes that, well, through imperfection and the things that we learn, we can grow and build upon uh, those things that we learn. And I think that the other comment says the only true wisdom is knowing that we know nothing. Well, I think when I was 21, I knew everything. And now that I'm in my 50s, I know very little. And I think one of the things that I've discovered is that as we begin to examine our life in the classroom as a teacher, as a friend, as a father, I think we grow and learn and develop. A couple of other greetings. We have Oscar, greetings from Madrid, uh, from China. Peter, thank you for joining us today. Good evening from Vietnam. Thank you. Your website is useful. And uh, you have an amazing voice. Well, I certainly, I think one of the things about being uh, online and sharing of voices is that you realize, well, you always have to try to improve everything that you do. And certainly as a teacher and as a father, I want to make sure that I'm very clear in the ideas that I share. So thank you very much. As we talk today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of the, our episode and presentation today. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to share some experiences that have helped me in my teaching, in my connection with my students and with my family. And uh, one of the things I, I encourage you to share your own experiences, number one, throughout the presentation, of course, but number one, in what way has your own father or mother or grandfather influenced your life? Please feel to share on that. And uh, throughout the broadcast and anything that I talk about, again, I create live broadcasts because I want them engaging. I want to hear your voice, not just my own. And that's why people come to a live broadcast. And I'd like to start with sharing a, a quote from Charles Ketterin. He was one of the most influential inventors of the 20th century in the United States. And he said this, every father should remember one day his son will follow his example, not his advice. And of course we could say one day, day his son or daughter. And one of the things that I look at that comment is that sometimes just like a lion is that sometimes our actions roar so loudly that we can't hear someone else's voice. In other words, it's a matter of what we do and not what we say that resonates or echoes in a thousand ears. And I think that I found that very true. And I'm going to come back to this quote at the very end as well. We have some other greetings from, uh, uh, from uh, Montreal also from Good Morning from Brazil. So it's great to have everyone with us. So uh, let's go again. I'm Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab talking about transformation and about transforming my teaching, fatherhood and my life. And I encourage my children, if any of my children are watching today, feel free to chime in as well. 
Well, one of the things that I mentioned in my last broadcast, and I'm going to connect that to what we're talking about today, is the idea, uh, let me go back here, is the idea of sometimes, whether it be as a friend, as a teacher, as a parent, sometimes we can't see the problems that are right before us because we don't know what we're looking for. And last time I showed this image uh, by an artist called Rusty Russ. And uh, sometimes if you look carefully, I ask people, how many uh, tigers do you see? And invariably people say, I see one. But if you look really closely at the stripes on the tiger, you will see the hidden tiger. And so as I look, being a father, being a teacher, sometimes I can't see the problems that are right in front of my face. And often it's because of a number of reasons which I'm going to share today. So I'm going to talk about six lessons that I've learned. And as I do so, I'm going to try to emphasize each one, tying that to fatherhood, but also tying that to just being a teacher and a friend and so forth. So the first one is realize that I could be wrong about so many things and not even know it. In other words, sometimes in our life, we find that we're so unaware of how unaware we are. I mean, at work, at home, in friendships, sometimes we might say something and we're completely clueless that we've offended someone as well. And one thing that often happens is that we lack the awareness. We lack the awareness of when we are wrong. And this is called wrongology. And be thinking, again, I'm Randall, be thinking about how these, tie, these ideas tie into your own teaching, into your own studies, into your own relationships with others. And when I speak about wrongology, I think about this. Now, imagine as a teacher, or as a student, you see a student on her smartphone. You see another student sleeping in the back of the room. A child of yours is not completing their homework. And in each case, what runs through your mind? I remember as a teacher, especially earlier in my career, well, earlier in my, in my career, people didn't have smartphones, but I'm talking about at times where I've seen students holding a smartphone and making the simplistic assumption that, oh, they must be texting a friend, girlfriend or boyfriend, or a student sleeping in the back of classroom, probably stayed up too late playing video games, or a child of mine who is not doing the homework. Oh, they're just, they just don't care. And one of the things that I've slowly realized over time is this. Sometimes, we misjudge people. Be thinking about that as a teacher, as a friend, as a parent. Why do we often misjudge people? Why does that happen? And I think one of the reasons it comes down to is simplistic assumptions. We come to simplistic conclusions. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail as well. So one of the learning key is, one of my favorite books is right here. It's called Being Wrong. And every book that I show you is actually going to be in the, uh, the show notes at the end of this presentation. And one of the power of this being wrong is this. This is a book by Karen Scholes. And she said, however disorienting, difficult, or humbling our mistakes might be, it is ultimate wrongness, not rightness, that can teach us who we are. So as I began to explore some of these same situations, right? For example, with students, sometimes I realize, or with families, sometimes the biggest communication problem that we have is that we often don't listen to understand, but we simply listen to reply. And this is a, a quote that I shared in my last episode. Imagine, for example, you're having a discussion with a student of wondering why they're sleeping in class. And again, we're formulating ideas. Well, probably they've been playing video games. Or with a child, one of the greatest mistakes I've made is making simplistic assumptions about why my children might not be doing homework. Why? And then I realize, Maybe they're being bullied at school. 
Maybe they're struggling with other issues that are beyond my awareness. And sometimes these feelings, these assumptions kind of bar us from being able to see people a little bit clearer. One of my other favorite books is called The Invisible Gorilla, How Our Intuitions Deceive Us. This is another great book that allows us to understand things that are beyond our awareness. Sometimes it's called inattentional blindness. So one of the questions I want you to think about and feel free to share is, have you ever been wrong about someone or something? What did, this, what did you learn from this experience? And how did you learn to see? Let's see if we have any other comments. Uh, I have a comment, Rita says, one of the points you mentioned in the presentation happens. I ponder about my teaching methods and ask myself what went wrong and try to change them. Riyadh, thank you so much. I think this is a clear point of that self-reflection of being able to think, why did I make that mistake? Great idea. And again, we have from uh, Yasarita, thank you, Randall. Happy Father's Day and Grandfather's Day. Another comment was right here. My mother played an important role in my life. So, and again, we're not talking about just fathers, but anyone who has been influential. I became a teacher of English thanks to her encouragement. She gave me some private lessons in the summer before learning in school. She paved the way to be passionate about this lesson. And I think that idea of being passionate is critically important. Thank you very much for sharing those. So let's go on to the next point. So the first one is realizing that I could be wrong and not even realize it. The next point is to live authentically with vulnerability. Now, what, is, what does that mean? Well, let me share with you a true story. It's somewhat of a vulnerable story, but I think it's relevant to the topic. Many years ago, this is pre-marriage life. I've been married for over 30 years. And as I was dating my wife, I was visiting her in her apartment. I saw a bookshelf and I thought, oh, she likes to read. And I, the conversation went something like this. You know, if a woman asks you or a man asks you if you like to read and you're dating, there's only one answer. And I said, well, yeah, of course I like to read. And I looked on her bookshelf and I found a book that I had never read and it looked thick. It looked big. And it's course called Moby Dick by Herman Melville, over 500 pages. Now, my wife is the type of person to ask questions, probing questions. She, she would be the type to say, let's talk about the philosophical underpinnings of the character development. And I realized this was before the time where you could do a Google search and, you know, summary, Moby Dick. And it wasn't until later that I had to acknowledge at that particular time, I didn't like reading at all. And so one of the things that I think we struggle with is that whether as individuals or as teachers is sometimes acknowledging our imperfections, our, our lack of knowledge. Now, I, I have a question for teachers, and this happened to me over 30 years ago. I was in the classroom, and a student said to me, Randall, what is the difference between lay and lie? And I paused. And this could be every day and every day. Or what is the difference between whom and whom? And what is the difference between compliment and compliment? And in that particular moment, not wanting to acknowledge my inability to answer the question, I said something like this, oh, that's just something we cover in the next level. And one of the things that I realized is I just didn't want to look like I didn't know. And, and I, some questions maybe to you might be, when have you worried about what others think about you, your friends, your family, teachers, students. And some people say to me, I don't worry about what people think. But I think the reality is, is that many of us or most of us really do. And when you feel vulnerable to acknowledge imperfection or your inability to answer questions, what emotions do you feel? Well, one of the things that I think I've learned over time, still deeply imperfect, 
is that we often, and one of my favorite quotes is, we often wear ourselves out trying to be someone we aren't or aren't meant to be. And in other, in other words, we pretend to be what we aren't, what we aren't, or we pretend to want to know what we don't. It's kind of like this. This is who I really am. Or this picture of me making pizza at home. This is who I really am. I really would like, boy, if I could, uh, I'd really like to be this person. I, I want to be this. Or I want to be this. I'd like to do this. But the rea reality is I'm like this. This is a picture both my brothers standing uh, next to me. And I don't know why my mother dressed me up like this, but that's not who I want to be, all right? Often, for example, as a father, sometimes we begin to compare ourselves. You know, we compare. I want to have the perfect family, right? I want to have the perfect job. I want to have the perfect classes. I want to be the best teacher and students. And you could fill in that blank. I want to be the perfect whatever. And sometimes comparisons come up. And I remember raising my children. All of my children are adults now, but there have been many times where, boy, if, if only, if only, if only I did things better, if only things were working out in the way that I hoped. We constantly compare ourselves. And one of my favorite books, this comes from Brene Brown. I have several books to share with you is that she said in the book, The Gifts of Imperfection, one of my favorite books. Again, I'll be leaving these books in the show notes. She said, authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It is about the choice to show up, be real, um, to, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. And Brene Brown has written a number of books. Another book is called Dare Greatly, Having the Courage to Do Difficult Things. She wrote another book called Rising Strong. And all of these books have to do with vulnerability of having courage and so forth. And the, the power of authenticity, of not wearing a mask of inauthenticity to protect yourself from the beliefs and thoughts and expectations of others is an authenticity of opening up and sharing your story of struggle with others is it builds deeper human connection with others. I mean, even as my own children have seen me over time of sharing concerns, I think it builds connections. It also attracts real people. People think that you're all, see you as authentic, as real, not pretentious. And the other idea is that authenticity helps you wear the same face, the same, you're the same person, no matter what the circumstances are. So my thoughts to you are, what does authenticity and vulnerability? Vulnerability, the willingness to open up and share your story. And are there times when you have been afraid of sharing your struggles with others? And I truly believe, and one thing that has been said again and again, is that people have to earn the right to hear your story. And I think through being authentic and vulnerable, we can achieve that. A couple of other thoughts that have come in. Uh, so glad to be here in your live broadcast. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, not more fast to get it. I try to speak clearly and feel free to let me know if I'm speaking too quickly. Elizabeth says, when I was younger, I made judgments on people based on my own insecurities. And Elizabeth, I think that's what happened to me a lot of times. All right. I think to see your mistakes, you have to put yourself out there and take risks. If you wrap yourself in your own certainties, for lack of a better word, you're going to have a harder time seeing, uh, seeing other things, other people and your mistakes. And I think that is really common. I think we do a lot to protect ourselves. At least I do. Another Isarita says, yes, I have been wrong about methods I used in the class. Sometimes a lesson doesn't, doesn't go as I plan. So the whole lesson may go haywire, go wild, but I must admit my imperfections to my students and they have a good laugh. And I think a lot of teachers say, yeah, 
If I make a mistake and I don't know something, I'll acknowledge that. But the reality is I think that we don't. I think we're afraid. Okay. You are the perfect. I don't know if I'm the perfect father or the teacher, but I think all of us learning from our mistakes. And Rihad says, the best thing is to be yourself if possible. Absolutely. And, and finding people and surrounding yourself with people who make you feel whole just the way you are. Uh, another sent Anna says, um, I started using your site for my classes and then continue many years. And then I started learning about who you are and your story. Thank you for everything you share. Thank you very much for those comments. Well, let's go on to the next idea is uh, it's these deal with thinking errors and thinking errors can often lead to judgment and rash actions in the classroom and with our family. Now think about these situations, all right? Ah, and I'm not saying these are real situations, but these could happen. Oh, my daughter is hanging out with a guy with two earrings and owns a gun store. Bad news. Or, oh, my son is quitting his job to join a heavy metal band. Danger. Or, hey, people from that country are, and sometimes you can fill in the blank. You know, there's so many times that we make hasty excuse me, conclusions about other groups of people, whether it be xenophobia, whether it be racism, whether it be whatever time of harmful judgment that we have. And sometimes we do this as teachers, all oh, students from that part of the country, all oh, students from the city, they are very damaging. And the reason why the, we do this is often due to something that we call confirmation bias. And what is confirmation bias? How does that play into our relationships with our children and with our friends and neighbors? Well, one of the my favorite books is this one right here. Right? And I can show it to you. Let me zoom that in here. It's called Don't Believe Everything You Think. Don't Believe Everything That You Think. And again, all of these books will be in the show notes. And this book makes a powerful statement. It says the following, we evaluate evidence in a biased fashion. Imagine whatever evidence it might be, something that you see in the classroom, something you see from a, in a friend, something as a father that you see in a child. We pay particular attention to evidence that supports our own point of view and then either ignore or discount the discount the importance of evidence that contradicts our beliefs. In fact, the desire to maintain our own belief often makes us avoid situations that would unearth contradictory evidence in the first place. Like we try to avoid information that would deconfirm what we believe. And that's what's called confirmation bias. We look for information that simply confirms our beliefs. Let me give you an example of this. A common story is this, that there's a man that, well, he's interested in getting a donut from a local donut store. And he's looking for a sign that he should go and get it. And he says to himself, hey, if there is a parking space available out front, then it is a sign that I should stop and get a donut. And what happens? Well, there is, he finds a parking space in front of the donut shop after driving around the block 12 times. And that idea of confirmation bias is we tend to look for information that simply confirms our beliefs about our children, about our friends, and about our classrooms. A couple of comments that you might want to share is, what kinds of misjudgments do we see in the news today? All right, that are the result of misinformation or confirmation bias. And how about examples in raising our kids? How do we misjudge? How do we misjudge them? Certainly are important. Couple of ideas, let's see what else. Um, Randa, you, you've got a great library, thanks for sharing. And one of the things that, yes, that I think I've learned over time is that, yes, 30 years ago, I didn't love to, like to read, but I love to read. And it goes back to that idea of when I was 21, I knew everything. And now I'm in my 50s and I'm still, still constantly trying to learn. Have someone else from Jen from uh, the Philippines. Thanks for joining us. 
And also Jen says, you're right. I also shared your sites to my students. He's very generous. Well, thank you. And I think one of the things that just over time we continue to try to understand about ourselves and so forth. The next point, and again, we have six points today. I'm Randall from Randall's ESR Cyber Listening Lab. And feel free to share any comments about this presentation, about your parents, fathers, anyone who has influenced you. The next point deals with admitting your mistakes and being accountable and then forgiving others of their mistakes and letting them go. I wanna share an experience that my own son taught me and it wasn't something that I necessarily taught him. Maybe it rubbed off on him. And this is about my son, Josh. And I can talk about my son, Josh. Uh, normally, I wouldn't name people you know, by name. Our son, Josh, he uh, passed away eight years ago. But this is a lesson that I think he greatly shared with me. And when he was about, I think, about 13 years old, he wanted to talk to me privately in his room. And I said, what is it, Josh? And he said, dad, I have something to share with you. He said, uh, I stole a couple of small items from a, a few stores. And boy, to acknowledge something like this. And I said, well, Josh, when did this happen? He said, a couple of years ago. And I realized this was weighing on, on him, but he, he recognized, you know what? I, I need to apologize. And I said, well, what are you going to do? What would be a good course of action? And allowing him to think through this, I wasn't about to say, no, don't worry about it. It happened long ago. And I wasn't going to say, you need to go down there. And he said, no, I'm going to go back to these stores, acknowledge what I did, and accept whatever consequence comes. And that was that was deeply moving to me as a father of someone willing to do that. And one of the things that I find that as teachers, sometimes we make mistakes in the classroom. Maybe we don't grade something correctly, or maybe the student has a point. We wrote something on the board. It was a mistake. It wasn't clear. Do we acknowledge the mistakes that we, that we make, or do we try to recover or pass that off or or whatever. And some of the things that we find that we need to do a better job of acknowledging mistakes. One of my favorite books is this one right here. It's going to be in the show notes. It's mistakes were made, but not by me. Why we justify foolish beliefs, bad decisions, and harmful acts. And I think we sometimes do this. And this is the quote that came from this book. As, as fallible human beings, all of us share the impulse to justify ourselves and avoid taking responsibility for any actions and, and that turn out to be harmful, immoral, or stupid. Most of us find it difficult, if not impossible, to say, I was wrong, I made a terrible mistake. And the question is, why? They go on to talk about in the book, the higher the stakes, emotional, financial, moral, the greater the difficulty, it goes further than that. Most people, when directly confronted by evidence that they are wrong, do not change their point of view or course of action, but justify it even more tenaciously. In other words, we have a tendency sometimes to hold on to the idea of being right. And one of the things that, you know, I find fascinating are all of the lessons that you can learn in Disney movies. And my grandson loves a number of Disney movies, including the show Moana. There was a period of time where it was constantly going Moana, Moana, and you should take a look at it. And in the story Moana by Disney, there is one of the main characters is Maui. And Maui makes a significant mistake in the movie. And he says this, which I think is transformational in the way that we should respond to others. He said, what I did was wrong. I have no excuse and I'm sorry. No excuses, just coming straight out and saying how things should be done. And so one of the things that we should always is number one is, is admit our mistakes, whether as a parent whether as a teacher and so forth. But the other thing is to forgive others of their mistakes and let them move on. And this is probably one of the greatest lessons I learned from my father 
a few years ago, we were out to eat and one of my children looked at my dad and said, Grandpa, what was my dad like growing up? And I say, oh, no, oh, oh no, no, not that one. Oh, 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 don't remember that one. And my father said something that really helped me understand this idea. He said, I couldn't have asked for a better son, period. And that's all he said. There was nothing going back. Well, he did that. He did this and that. But he allowed me. He allowed me to move on. And I think that is so important. I think in my own teaching, I've had students. And I don't know, teachers, if you've ever had this experience or with friends, with family members, we sometimes constantly remind them of their past mistakes, even if it's something that happened 5, 10, 15 years ago. And I think if students, for example, in your class, made a mistake, copied homework, cheated, whatever, do we allow them the opportunity to move on? And I think there was a period of time in my own teaching where I kept bringing these things up and they did nothing to allow allow the student to heal. I think they were minor things. They're often minor or micro aggressive behaviors, really small things, but they are significant. And I think as a parent, you have to be careful not to say something like, oh, you have so much potential. And then we add the word, but. And love and respect should never end with a comma or the word, but. All right. So one of the other things I might ask you, and feel free to share any of your comments. I appreciate those comments coming in. Why are we so unwilling or unable to admit mistakes as a teacher, as a friend, as a parent? And why do we tend to hold on to grudges long after their expiration date? I think those are important. Couple of ideas. Uh, mistakes are the best teachers. I completely agree. Absolutely. And, and Mai says, uh, can we download the book, teacher? You know what? These would be, uh, I'm going to have a list of the books at the end of the show notes. You might be able to find them online through a service like Audible and so forth. Uh, download them in PDF. Uh, that certainly would be an option. A lot of times I like a hard copy, but certainly understandable. And again, I really like the idea of mistakes are the best teachers, especially if you're willing to admit those mistakes. And the other thing Peter said, wow, so many books in this broadcast. Have you read all these books? Uh, yes, I have. Um, and to, in in one of our rooms, we have a whole series of books. We have books on all kinds of things. And our kids love to read. I think that's in part because of their mother. She loves to read. And I think, again, I think over time, I just realized how much, li how little I know on different things. All right. Well, let's go on to the next points here. Uh, is uh, point number five. And we have two more points to share with you. Again, I'm Randall. Please share your comments about anything we're discussing today about fatherhood, about teaching, about mistakes, about thinking errors, and so forth. The next point I'd like to talk is about express deep compassion for others. This is one thing that I have dis discussed in another episode, but I'd like to try to weave it into some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Some of you are aware that, that I that we have a son. We had a son named Joshua. And Joshua, he was born in Japan. And uh, when he was 10 years old, he attended the International TESOL Convention in, Bos uh, in Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland. This is a conference with over six, 7,000 teachers. He was probably the youngest attendee. He had his own name badge. He assisted me in one of my presentations. He loved anything Apple. He would write letters to Steve Jobs. And one of the fascinating things about him is that he was just very inquisitive. But as part of his life, he struggled with depression. He struggled with high-functioning autism and bipolar disorder. And they were very, very difficult times in his life. And over a period of 10 years, he struggled with this deeply. And then in 2012, he died by suicide. And the reason why I share his story a little bit is because sometimes when I'm thinking back to the idea of students that are sleeping in the classroom, 
that are texting on their phone. Maybe that student that is texting is texting maybe their father who is right now in the hospital uh, with their mother who is just recently diagnosed with cancer or the student that's sleeping in the, in the classroom because they stayed up all night taking care of a grandparent. Sometimes this level of compassion is sometimes beyond our awareness and we need to develop empathy. And one of the best books I really like on empathy is this one right here. It's called Empathy, Why It Matters and How to Get It. Again, these books will be in the show notes. And in this book, very powerful message, he says, empathy is the art of stepping is the art of stepping into the imaginatively into the shoes of another person, understanding their feelings and perspectives, and using that understanding to guide your actions. One of the biggest challenges, is, though, is that sometimes empathy is very tribal in nature. And what does that mean? We well, we tend to empathize with those that are in our in-group, that are in our own cultural group, that are in our communities. We tend to associate with people in that way. But sometimes we see, even in current events, that people, it's often more difficult to have empathy who is outside of that group. And this is an excellent book about talking about how to develop empathy even more. Well, one of the things that I asked, I asked one of my children, trying to be as transparent as possible, how have I done? And one of the things that I think that over time, having well been married for over 30 years, having children for over 30 years, there were times where I think I'm a pretty good father. And then realizing, again, going back to the principle of not being aware of those problems that we have. We're so unaware of how unaware we are. I asked one of my children, be honest and transparent. And my, my, my child said, dad, we used to call you robot dad behind your back because you seemed emotionless and impossible to connect to. Probably going back to the same ideas of not wanting to be wrong, uh, often coming up with the, uh, using confirmation bias to understand my kids and making a simplistic assumptions of why they were struggling, uh, not wanting to deal with pain, especially with our son, Joshua, who's going through a very difficult time. And when you feel overwhelmed, I felt at times that I had to draw myself into a cave to try to, to process my emotions. And uh, I asked my daughter and my daughter continued, dad, You've worked really hard to connect with us in the last seven and eight years. I really like, I really feel like we've had a relationship with you now. And that's really meaningful for me. But I think I would transfer that back into the classroom. I think there were many times where I wasn't able to connect as well with students for many different reasons. So a couple of other questions on this point were, how do you develop empathy? especially for those who are different than you are? And what is the difference between sympathy and empathy? Feel free to comment on those questions as well. A couple of th thoughts. Uh, Isarita, thank, uh, sorry for your loss. And one of the things that I mentioned that is that everyone experiences loss and even teachers even teachers. I've been at conferences where I share a similar message and where teachers in the corridors come in, up and say to me, Randall, I struggle too, but I can't acknowledge that. I can't tell my colleagues. I can't tell my fam family because of insecurity and that, well, vulnerability of being authentic. Another com a comment comes in from Kayla Vargas. He says, at the end, students might forget what you taught them in terms of the class content, but they will never forget how you treated them. It is vital to remember that everyone is a person and that we all have different hardships at home. And I think that, uh, Kayla, thank you very much. I think that's so true because really, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Victor says, it is super important to put yourself in the student's position. And from that perspective, you can easily detect what is wrong with you. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think we often see things from a very egocentric worldview. We see things through the glasses of our own perspectives. Uh, Yusadito says, empathy is being in someone else's shoes. Yeah, and I think it's being in someone's shoes and then walking in those shoes for mile after mile after mile. Uh, definitely so important. Well, the last point is like I shared today is about self compassion, nurturing self-compassion. What do I mean by this? There's so many times that I've seen teachers and students beat themselves up for the problems that they have, the problems that are not self-inflicted. In other words, as a father, sometimes I've wrestled with the idea, I wish I was a better father. And then I start beating myself up about things that are beyond my control. Sometimes I see students doing the same thing. Randall, I'm in level two and I should be in level 29. And sometimes that can be really difficult for the student to see, you know, stop beating yourself up. Well, one of my favorite books is this. Here is another book. This book is called Self-Compassion, Self-Compassion. And this is an excellent book. And this was the message that uh, Kristen Neff has. She says, there is almost no one whom we treat as badly as ourselves. Sometimes we just completely built, beat ourselves up. And I'm not saying that it's, an, it's not easy. Well, it, it isn't easy to try to get through that. If you're struggling with something difficult and someone says to you, just cheer up, things will get better tomorrow. Who, who knows if they're going to get better tomorrow? But yes, through vulnerability, through building friendships with people who understand you as a teacher and as a friend, I think we can help motivate each other and support one another. One of the important stories that is in the book, and I'd like to share with you, that I think talks about this theme. And she says in the book, a Native American wisdom story tells of an old Cherokee who was teaching his grandson about life. He says, a fight is going in on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One... <coughs> is evil. He is angry. He is anger. He is envy. He is sorrow. He is regret. He is greed. He is arrogance. He is self-pity. He is guilt. He is resentment. He is inferiority. He, he lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other wolf is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, and faith, oh, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. Then he continues, then she continues, the same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. Then the grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one that you feed. The idea of can we try to nurture ourselves through joy, peace, love, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, truth, compassion. And I think those type of things as highlighted in this book. Again, the book is called Self-Compassion, allows us to feel better about ourselves. Well, we're wrapping up today, and some of the things that I shared with you were realizing, number one, that I could re be wrong about so many things and not know it. Again, Randall Davis talking about some of the elements, not only related to teaching, but friendship and being a father, learning to live authentically with vulnerability, right, of showing our true selves to the world and realizing that as we take off our mask of inauthenticity, we discover people that are right next door that are feeling the same way, avoiding thinking errors that cause us to judge others, uh, admitting mistakes and forgiving others, including ourselves, express decent compassion. And even there is my mistake on express. 
All right. I need that R there. I know you're very forgiving uh, and acknowledging my mistake and nurturing self-compassion. Let's look if there are a couple more uh, questions here, uh, comments. Empathy requires work. It is not a brush off or a few kind words. Marcia, that is absolutely true. You don't get empathy by reading a book. So if you were to read this book on empathy, it's not like all of a sudden you're going to become an empath. That is absolutely true. It comes through compassion and kindness and showing other words, sincere friendship. All right. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Yes. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is going beyond that is actually stepping into those shoes, as you mentioned earlier, and walking and walking and walking with that person. Uh, Marel says, I like two wolves fighting inside of you, fighting for your soul, absolutely, and nourishing the one that will actually win. And the other is, Salem says, empathy needs the humanity in the human beings. And I think when you begin to show empathy, when you begin to see people as they really are, you begin to humanize versus dehumanize them. And I guess the thoughts of today, being Father's Day, of remembering the many people in my lives, in my life that has been instrumental, my father, my grandfather, family members and friends, my students and so forth, have just really been instrumental in change. And so today I've talked about a number of things. And again, the focus has been Focusing on transforming, transforming my teaching, transforming being as, as a person and so forth. And I'm hoping today the ideas that I shared will also be something that will be able to help you in your own lives, in your own transformation, realizing that this is step by step and it, there's ups and downs, valleys and hills that go a long way in our own learning. Feel free to share any comments after the broadcast. Next week, we have a really interesting broadcast that will be something you won't want to miss. And again, thank you for always joining me. Again, keep an eye on Facebook for any new postings and upcoming episodes. And again, thank you very much for joining today. See you next time.